We'd like to welcome everybody back here to Life's Greatest Battle. We are on location at the Central Florida Community College. The voice that you hear after our special music will be that of our evangelist, Philip Sizemore, who will bring to us a presentation titled, Just in Time. But prior to that, we are going to have a special musical selection by Wendy Finlay and Cheryl Rylea. Ladies. experience is dry, who have lost their heartfelt fervor along the way. They're just going through the motions, just filling empty space. If that's you, my friend, if you've lost the heart to pray. Good evening once again. I don't have no sound. Let's try it again. Good evening once again. I'm not coming through the speakers, am I? Am I coming through the speakers? It's just me then. Okay. Let us start off, before we get into God's message tonight from His Word, let us start off with a word of prayer. Let's bow our heads. Father in heaven, I again thank you for the opportunity to share your word. And I pray, Father, that tonight you will help us to have clear minds 
Lord, I pray that your spirit will speak to us as we open up this time prophecy from the book of Daniel. Lord, we know that the devil has been counterfeiting your truths, and I pray that you help us to untwist one another one of those tangled truths this night. And I ask it in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Title of the message, Just in Time. Um, we're going to be looking at a prophecy found in the book of Daniel chapter 9 tonight. Now, if you'll recall, like almost every meeting that you've come to, for the most part, for many of you anyway, from just conversing with you after the meetings, after the messages, almost everything that we one time kind of thought to be true, find out that the Bible actually didn't teach it sometimes. Have you, have you noticed that on quite a few things? If you remember, though, like the, the fourth night that we were together, we learned that for every truth that God has, the devil has a counterfeit. Do you remember that? Uh, just every time God would present a truth, the devil would always have something to counterfeit it because he did not want his people knowing what God's truths are. He did, the devil doesn't want that to happen. So he has to cover it up. He has to counterfeit it. And it looks so good. A counterfeit, remember, a counterfeit looks so good, it's believable. And tonight, once again, it will not be an exception to that. There's a prophecy in Daniel chapter 9 that points to Jesus Christ and when he would come. And the devil has taken that very same prophecy and modern Christianity, much of Christianity today, I'm a Christian myself, so don't, don't think that I'm running down Christianity in, in general. I'm just saying much of what's taught in Christianity today actually takes this same prophecy and, believe it or not, applies it to the Antichrist. A prophecy in the Bible that points to Jesus Christ and is twisted around in such a way that they actually apply it to the Antichrist. And frankly, just to be quite honest and, 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 and frank with you, that's the work of the devil. If, you, if, if there's a prophecy pointing to Jesus and we apply it to the devil or to the Antichrist, that is the work of the Antichrist. And so we're going to be looking at that prophecy this, tonight. The title of the message, once again, is Just in Time. We're going to find out Jesus came right on time. Let us open our Bibles up to the book of Daniel. The book of Daniel, chapter 9, is where we're going to right now. That's um, Matthew. If you go to the book of Matthew and start backing up, you've got like all the little books there, and you're going to the left, or you can go to Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, and Daniel in the Old Testament. Daniel chapter 9. Daniel chapter 9. We're going to read some of this right now. Daniel chapter 9, and I'm going to start reading in verse 20, and we're going to back up in chapter 8 and, and, and some other things tonight as well, but we're going to start reading right now in verse 20, and I want you to get an idea of what's taking place here. Daniel 9, 20. Everybody there? Okay, the Bible reads this way. And while I was yet speaking and praying and confessing my sin and the sins of my people Israel, hang a little, pull, the, pull a drawer out of your head right now and put something in that drawer and close it for me, okay? In Daniel 9, 20, he says, my people who? So who are Daniel's people? The children of Israel. Do you find that right there in the scriptures? So my people Israel, and presenting my supplication before the Lord, my God, and for the holy mountain of my God. Yea, while I was speaking in prayer, even the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, being called to fly swiftly, touched me about the time of the evening oblation. And he informed me and talked with me and said, Oh, Daniel, I have now come forth to give you skill and understanding. What did he come to give him? Skill and understanding. At the beginning of your supplications, the commandment came forth, and I am come to show you, for you are greatly beloved. Therefore, understand the matter and consider the vision. Okay, I have those, those highlights on the screen there from Daniel 9, 20 through 23. Gabriel, whom he had seen at the vision in the beginning, he comes to Daniel, and he gets to give him skill and understanding and to understand the matter and consider the vision. Well, there's something very interesting about Daniel chapter 9. Let me put it to you this way. When you open the book of Daniel and you start reading, if you're going to read it straight through, you get to Daniel chapter 2 and you find a dream, a vision. And then in Daniel chapter 2, you find an explanation of that dream. You, you read that. Remember opening night, we looked at that, right? And then you go on and you move along to Daniel chapter 4 and you'll find another vision, a dream. The king has this dream about a tree and the tree's cut down. And, and then in Daniel chapter 4, you find an explanation for that vision. Then you, get, then you move along and you get to Daniel chapter 7. Daniel chapter 7, once again, you find another vision. Daniel has a vision in Daniel chapter 7. And before the end of Daniel chapter 7 ends, God explains to him what that vision means. Remember, we looked at that when we studied the Antichrist. We studied a good part of that vision. There's still some of it we're going to go back and look at another night. Tomorrow night, as a matter of fact. So Daniel 2, Daniel 2, you have a vision, 
and an explanation. Daniel 4, vision, explanation. Daniel 7, vision, explanation. Then you move on to Daniel chapter 8. And in Daniel chapter 8, you find a vision and a partial explanation. A partial explanation. And then when you move to Daniel chapter 9, what we just read here, there is no vision. But yet, no vision in Daniel chapter 9. Now, now with that in mind, Daniel chapter 9, the first verses when you get down to starting in verse Daniel 9, 1, all the way to verse 20, it's basically Daniel praying and pouring his heart out to God. That's all it is. It's a long prayer. No vision. But yet, in Daniel 9, 20 through 23, you find him saying, Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning. Now, what vision? There is no vision in Daniel chapter 9. It says, I have come forth to give you skill and understanding. When you read Daniel 9, he's not asking for understanding. And then it says, understand the matter and consider the vision. The problem with that is, in Daniel chapter 9, there is no vision. So why would, wouldn't it seem strange to you, if you're having a prayer and you're praying for, for God to forgive you your sins and, and, and forgive your people their sins, because as it says in Daniel chapter 9 and verse 4, Daniel's like, oh, that we're, we've rejected your covenant, we haven't been keeping your commandments, we haven't listened to your servants, the prophets, in Daniel chapter 6, your, your, your prayer that you're praying, your heart is being poured out because you're asking forgiveness, and an angel comes to you and says, I've come now to give you skill and understanding. And you would say, for what? Right? Unless, unless you knew what the angel was talking about. Did you know there was a vision in Daniel chapter 8 that had a partial explanation and Daniel didn't know what was, being, what was going on with it? Open your Bible. Go on, we're still there. Go, go to Daniel chapter 8. I'm going to give you a little bit of the background of Daniel chapter 8 and we'll move on to the, the latter part of it. Daniel 8. And we'll just start off in verse 1 here just for a minute. In the third year of the reign of King Belshazzar, uh, the king of Belshazzar, a vision appeared unto me, even unto me, Daniel, after that which appeared unto me at the first. And I saw in the vision, and it came to pass when I saw, I was at Shushan in the palace, which is the providence of Elam, and I saw in a vision, and behold, a ri by the river of Uli. Then I lifted up my eyes, and I saw, and what did he see there? A ram. You see that? Okay, now go on down now to verse 5. And after he sees the ram and he sees some things going on with the ram, he says, then I considered and I saw a what? A goat. And then, he's, then he goes down, on down from there and he talks about these four horns and then a little horn. This little horn becomes exceedingly great. We're going to talk about the details of that tomorrow night, so I'm not going to get into that right now. But you understand that he's seeing this vision of, this, of, a, of a ram, a goat, four horns, and then another little horn, and the little horn rising up and attacking God, and, it, and it's going on like that. Okay? That's the vision he's having. Now, Follow me down, and we're still in Daniel chapter 8. Go down to verse 20 for a moment, Daniel 8, 20, and look what it says. The ram which you saw having the two horns are the kings of Medo-Persia. Do you think Daniel understood that? Likely, yeah. Like if I said, okay, this, this vision you had, this ram you saw, it's, it's Medo-Persia. Makes perfect sense, doesn't it? And then it goes on and says, the rough goat, that's the king of Greece. Makes sense, right? You, you think he understands the vision? And then it starts talking about this little horn, power, that comes up and starts conquering God's people and attacking God's people, attacking God's sanctuary, and God himself, as a matter of fact. And it explains that. Now, do you remember the little horn in Daniel 7? Do you think that Daniel understood the parallel? Probably understood all that, didn't he? Now, back up with me just for a moment to chapter, we're still in chapter 8. Look at verse 14. Daniel, in verse 13, I better start in verse 13, make it, make it flow. Daniel 8, 13, I heard one saint speak to another saint and said unto that certain saint which spake. That's a tongue twister. How long shall be the vision concerning the daily sacrifice and the transgression of desolation to give both the sanctuary and the host to be trodden underfoot? He said unto me, unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. Now, go right, my Bible's right across the page there. Look what it, the Bible says in verse 26. You still there? Daniel 8, 26. Now, remember, he explained the ram, the goat, the horn. He's explaining all that stuff. But now he gets to the point about the time part of the prophecy, right? Daniel 8, 14, that's a time prophecy, isn't it? 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. Is that a time prophecy? If, you, if, you say, if you're given a day prophecy like that, that's a, what we would call a time prophecy. Look what it says in Daniel chapter 8, verse 26. The vision of the evening and morning which was told is true. Wherefore, shut up the vision, for it shall be for many days. So it gets to the part about the 2,300 days, the, the vision of the evening and mornings. That's literally translated from, from actually back in verse 14. Some Bibles you may have out there, a New King James Version or something, it literally translates uh, Dan, uh, Daniel 8, 14. Instead of saying 2,300 days, it'll literally say evenings and mornings. Some of, your, some of your center column references will say the same thing. So in verse 26, he says, that vision, the part of the vision you had of the evening and mornings there, is everybody with me? Okay, that part of the vision, look what he says. Shut it up 
for it will be for many days. All right? Now look at verse 27. I, Daniel, fainted and was sick certain days, and afterward I rose up and did the king's business, and I was astonished at the vision, but none understood it. Now, what part of the vision was it that was not explained that nobody understood? The time prophecy. You understand that? I mean, do you think he understood that the, that the goat was Medo-Persia? I mean, the, the ram was Medo-Persia and the goat was Greece? Very clear when the Bible tells you so, right? And it's a little horn and a little horn power doing all these things. But then it says, hey, the part about the time, shut it up. And Daniel says, I was confused. No one understood it. The last time you find Daniel not understanding a vision is at the, is it at the end of Daniel chapter 8. Do you see that? At the end of Daniel chapter 8, he says, no one understood the vision. Verse 27. Everybody see that, right? Now, you've got to understand this. You have to see this. This is setting a foundation. I want you to make sure you see it. So at the end of Daniel 8, 27, he did not understand the vision. Then in Daniel chapter 9, he's praying, and he says, look, Daniel, I've come to give you an answer to your prayer. I've come to give you understanding. Remember, we looked at that right there. And, and now understand the matter and consider the vision. Daniel 9, 23, right? So now what's he coming to give an understanding of? Uh, well, a prophecy, a prophecy. Now we're going to find out this same prophecy that he opens up in Daniel 9 is a time prophecy. Now, it's very fascinating because you got over here in Daniel chapter 8. What part of the prophecy didn't he un did he not understand? The time prophecy. And then you get to Daniel chapter 9, and what part's he going to explain to him? Time prophecy. Oh, isn't the Bible beautiful? When you just spend a little time studying it, look what it says here. We're going to the screen, Daniel 8, 26. Oh, I've already read that. Let's just skip on through that. I'm sorry, I had that up on the screen, but we've already read it. Daniel 8, 26 and 27. None understood the vision, but we're getting to the point we understand now. Daniel 9, 24, all right? In your Bible, if you're in Daniel chapter 9, we read Daniel chapter, all the way down to chapter uh, 9, verse 23. We read down to verse 23 where it says, understand the matter and consider the vision. And we learned in Daniel chapter 8, the last thing that he did not understand was a, a part of the vision dealing with time. Now look at the very first word, the very first part of Daniel chapter 9 and verse 24. Seventy weeks are determined upon your people and the holy city. Before I go any further, let's just stop right there for a moment. Go back from the screen here. Stop there a minute. And it says, 70 weeks are determined upon your people and upon the holy city. What kind of prophecy, if it says 70 weeks, what kind of prophecy is that? Very elementary, isn't it? So the last time Daniel did not understand a prophecy was in Daniel chapter 8. At the very end of it, verse 27, I don't understand. You get to Daniel chapter 9, he's not asking for understanding of anything. The angel comes and says, okay, I'm going to give you understanding of a time prophecy. And here's how it starts. Back to the screen. Seventy weeks are determined upon your people and upon the holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, and to bring in everlasting righteousness and to seal up the vision and the prophecy and to anoint the most holy. Now, it said there in your Bible that seventy weeks were determined upon your people. Who's he talking to? He's talking to Daniel. Yeah, but you remember, we already looked at that back in, in verse 20. Verse 20, it says Daniel's people are Israel. So how much time here is, is, is the determined upon Daniel's people? Seventy weeks are, right? Now, I got a question I want to ask you, and then I'm going to, it's kind of a rhetorical type because I'm going to answer it for you as well. The word determined there in Daniel chapter 9 and verse 24, where it says 70 weeks are determined upon your people, what does the word determined mean there? It's a pretty good question, isn't it? Like if I'm going to determine something, that means in English, that means I, I've, I've made up my mind I'm going to do it, right? I've determined I'm going to do it. But is that what it means right here? Seventy weeks, I've made up my mind on your people? Very interesting. If you look at the original word here that you find in, in the Hebrew written out there, it's only found one place in all the Bible. Only one place. And I'm going to put it on the screen here. It's on the screen. The word is, can somebody say that for me? Chathak? Chathak? Chathak. Chathak. Thank you, Scotty. All right. The word means determined. I don't know how to pronounce it, but I know what it means. It means, the word determined means to be cut off. Literally means to be cut off. In other writings... Jewish writings outside the Bible, they do find that word used, shatak. And it's used usually in conjunction with the sacrificial system cutting an, a, an arm or a leg or something off of an animal, right? Cutting something off of an animal for sacrifice. The word literally means to be cut off. Is everybody okay with that? The word shatak, <laughs> it means to be cut off, okay? And so back to the, well, what we're reading here in verse 24, 70 weeks are cut off upon your people. Now, tomorrow night, we're going to do what's called the, what we, what's the longest time prophecy in the Bible, the 2,300-day prophecy. You found it there in Daniel 8, 14, right? This time is cut off from something. What do you suppose it's cut off from? The longer time, right? To be cut off. That's what the word means. 
So he says, 70 weeks, Daniel. Now listen, this is the part that's important tonight. 70 weeks are cut off for your people. Who's Daniel's people? Israel. So I'm going to use 70 weeks on you. You're the cho your chosen people for 70 weeks. So we're, I got that on the screen there. 70 weeks are for Daniel's people, the children of Israel. Now, if I were going to say to you something like this, now this is very important for people that have studied this prophecy and they have a, 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 what I'm going to call a misunderstanding at this point. If I were to say to you something like this, uh, Daniel, right? Daniel, I'm going to come to your house and spend a month. And, and you say, okay, you can come and spend a month at my house. All right? I'll say, well, I'm going to be there tomorrow. Okay? So tomorrow I show up at your house, and, and at the middle of the month, I leave. But how long did I tell you I was going to be there? A month. Okay? So I leave his house in the middle of the month. And then about eight or nine weeks later, I come back and say, Daniel, I'm here for the rest of that month. You're like, well, I'm busy. I'm not going to be home. But, but you said I could stay there a month. In other words, if I say to somebody, I'm going to stay at your place for a month, what do you assume is going to, how, how, what, how do you assume or what do, you, what do you suppose that month is going to consist of? 30 consecutive days, right? You, you, don't, you don't assume that like, like, like after like three weeks of it, I'm going to leave off and then sometime in the distant future, I'm going to come back and say, okay, I want the rest of that month now, do you? All right, so when the Bible says here, that's why it's important. I want you to understand this because many people take this prophecy in Daniel chapter 9, and it says 70 weeks are for Daniel's people, for the Jews, right? They take 69 of the weeks and say, okay, that was for the Jews, but now the 70th week, that's cut off, and that's put off sometime way out into the future, to a much distant future after the Antichrist and after all these things, and then the 70th week will be fulfilled. But you don't find that in the context of the Bible. Do you understand? So it says 70 weeks are for your people. They would be consecutive 70 weeks. I mean, just logic would tell you you don't have, okay, 70 weeks, and all of a sudden we're going to move that, that last week out into the future somewhere. That, this does not make sense. We'll show up from the Bible as well, but I just wanted you to get that in your mind. When it says 70 weeks are for your people, do you think Daniel had the assumption, well, only 69 was, and then the 70th will be sometime in the future? It would not make sense, would it? Let us go on through the text here as we continue on. I'm going to read Daniel 9.25 now. You ready? Daniel 9.25. I think I might even have it on the screen. Let's see, Daniel 9, 25. And let us read it out of our Bible. Know, therefore, and understand, speaking to Daniel, know and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince. Who's Messiah the Prince? Jesus, right? Okay, know, therefore, from the commandment to restore and rebuild Jerusalem till Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks, three score and two weeks. The street will be built again and the wall even in troublous times. You know what's fascinating about this? Let us go to the screen now. Daniel 9, 25. From the going forth of the commandment to restore and rebuild Jerusalem till Messiah the Prince shall be, look what it says, seven weeks and three score and two weeks. You know what we've just found out? God told Daniel when the Messiah is going to come. The first time. He said, I I've told you, he's going to come. From the time they re restore and rebuild the temple till Messiah the Prince shall be 69 weeks. Is that what it says? Seven weeks is seven weeks. You add three score and two weeks, which is 62. Three score is, uh, a score is 20. You add three score, it's 60. You add two, 62. 62 and seven is 69 weeks. So 69 weeks from the decree to go and, and restore and rebuild Jerusalem, Messiah's going to come. Now, if you were Daniel, would you be a little excited? Now, the Bible says no man knows the day or the hour of the, of the Lord's coming. Doesn't it say that? That's his second coming. That's his second coming. Jesus was here the first time. So this prophecy would be about what? Jesus' first coming. Because the Bible is very clear. There's, there's, there's no, no one knows the day or the hour of his second coming. So 69 weeks and the Messiah comes. Now, if you're Daniel, are you excited? Oh, wow, I'm going to know when the Messiah is going to come. 69 weeks from sometime soon. All right. Let us go on and see if we can determine. Let's see if we can find out. Well, before we do that, let me show you on the screen here. If you have seven days in a week, right? Seven days, and it says seven weeks. Seven times seven is 49. So 49 days is part of it. Then he says the other part was 62 weeks. 62 times seven is 434. So if you add those together, 434 and 49, you come up with 483 days. So from the commandment to go forth to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince shall be how long? 483 days. Is everybody on the same page with me? No problem. 60, 69 weeks, 69 times seven is 483. 483 days from the time the prophecy goes forward to restore and rebuild Jerusalem, the Messiah comes. Awesome, huh? Isn't that good? Right out of your Bible. It's amazing how exciting it is to study the Bible, isn't it? All right, let us find out if it works out just like that. Now, all we have to do, all we have to do is find out when that decree goes out 
to restore and rebuild Jerusalem, we find that decree biblically, historically, biblically, and then we can calculate from there and find out when the Messiah is going to come. Couldn't we do that? Did you know the Bible gives you that decree? There's actually four decrees you find in the Bible for to restore and rebuild Jerusalem, but one of those decrees actually gives the, the children of Israel, the Jews, full autonomy, where they have, they're able to govern themselves, they're able to rebuild everything and put it back together all again. And that time is nailed down in history, and you can find that time in the book of Ezra, chapter 7, verses 7 through 24. I'm not going to read all of that, but if you want to find the book of Ezra, you go to the book of Chronicles. You, you know, 1 Kings, 2 Kings, 1 Chronicles, 2 Chronicles. The next book is Ezra. Then you got Nehemiah, Esther, Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and around there. So, Ezra is right after Chronicles. Ezra 7 and verse 7. Let us read that part anyway. Can everybody find it? Old Testament. After the book of Chronicles. Find Kings. Go after the book of Samuel. Joshua. Judges. All right. Chapter 7, verse 7. Ezra. And there went up from the children of Israel and of the priests and of the Levites and the singers and the porters and the Nethamans unto Jerusalem in the seventh year of Artaxerxes the king. So when did they go up? What year is this? Seventh year of Artaxerxes the king. Now, I'm going to throw that up on the screen real quick. The seventh year of Artaxerxes the king. Now drop down with me to verse 13. We're still in the seventh year of Artaxerxes the king. What year? The seventh year. Now look at verse 13. I make a decree that all they of the people of Israel and of his priests and the Levites my, in my realm, which are minded at their free will to go up to Jerusalem to go with you. So what does it say there in verse 13? He makes a what? A decree to do what? Go back to Jerusalem. I make a decree to go back to Jerusalem, okay? Drop on down to verse 23. We're still in the same chapter. We're still in the same year. Look how he, he's going through, and he's making this letter all out, giving them the commandments to go back. That's what it's about. It's all about the decree to go back. I'm just showing you the highlights. You can read the whole chapter on your own if you want to, but for the sake, sake of time, we're not going to do that right now. Verse 23. Whatsoever is commanded by the God of heaven, let it be diligently done for the house of God of heaven. For why should there be wrath against the realm of the king of his son? So the Bible says in verse 23, whatever needs to be done, do it diligently for the God of heaven, rebuilding the temple. That's the context there, rebuilding the temple. Whatever needs to be done, go do it. Now drop down to verse 24. Verse 24, also we certify you that touching any of the priests and Levites and singers and porters and Nethanim, I always have trouble with that word, or ministers of his house of God, it shall not be lawful to impose toll or tribute or custom upon them. In other words, the king gives the children of Israel their temple, their streets, their city, all back to them and says, you know what? I'm not even going to charge you tribute. No more taxes. You govern yourself. Full autonomy. That's the decree. And it's a nailed down date in history. The seventh year of the reign of, of Artaxerxes is 457 B.C. It's a historical date. 457 B.C., the seventh year of the reign of Artaxerxes. You can look that one up. So now look here. This is exciting, isn't it? Remember it said six, uh, uh, six, 483 days from the decree, the Messiah would come. So all we have to do now is go back to 457 B.C. We add 483 days, and we come to 455 B.C. About a year and a half. Yeah, a year and four months. Thank you. So a year and four months after 457 B.C., the Messiah came, right? No, not even, not, not even close, is it? So I'm going I'm to let you in a little, on a little secret from your Bibles tonight. In the Bible, when you're talking about prophecy, and you have a day, a literal day there, or, or a prophetic day, it's actually equals to a literal year. Now, I have some people, they like, to be, they like to be very cynical, and they'll say something like, oh, now, wait a minute. Doesn't the Bible say a day with the Lord is as a thousand years and a thousand years is as a day? It says it twice. It says it in Psalm verse 90, chapter 90 and verse 4, the 90th Psalm, verse 4 rather, and it says a day with the Lord is as a thousand years, a thousand years as a, is as a day when it is passed in his sight. And then you also have in, in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 8, it says a, thousand day, a, a, year with, a, a day with the Lord is as a thousand years and a thousand years as a, is as a day. So let us plug that in. If we plug one day is equal to 1,000 years, and we go from 457 B.C., and we add 483 years, or 483,000 years to that, then Messiah come 483,000 years after 457 B.C. So we probably can't apply a day is equal to 1,000 years in Bible prophecy, can we? But let me show you some Bible texts that where we have examples of, peop of God's people in the Bible using a prophetic, uh, God using himself, a day equals to a prophetic year. Let me show you some texts in the Bible for that. The first one we're going to look at is Ezekiel chapter 4 and verse 6. Ezekiel 4, 4, 6, it says, I have appointed thee each day for a year. 
Okay? He says, after you've done this, turn on your side again. And, and, and then he just goes and tells him, I've appointed you each day for a year. Ezekiel is the prophetic book of the Bible. He's talking about a prophecy each day for a year. You can read the context in Ezekiel 4 or 6. Also, you have Numbers chapter, Numbers chapter 14 and verse 34. Remember the children of Israel went and spied out the land? Remember when they done that? And, and Moses sent them to spy out the land, the promised land, and they went to spy it out. Does everybody remember that? Do you? Yes? Okay. How long did they go spy out the land? Forty days. And they come back and they said, oh, it's wonderful. They got these big fruit and they got all these great things. It, it, oh, it's just wonderful there. Except one major problem. The people are so big we can't do it. And God says to them, or, or actually you have Caleb and Joshua saying, we can do it. We can do it. God's with us. And the rest of the people were ready to kill them because they said, no, we're not going to go because we'll get killed. And they upset God, if you could do that. And God says, okay, fine. If you won't do what I'm telling you to do, you're going back into the wilderness for 40 years. Because you, you fight out the land for 40 days, you're going back for 40 years. I appoint you each day for a year. So you have, you have more than one time in the Bible, and there's other places as well. We're just going to do this for the context. That if we apply it one day, is equal to a literal year. Now, I've given you some examples of that. I've showed you where you can't use 1,000 years as a day because that would be 483,000 years, and surely that, that he's come before now, right? And we still got a long ways to go for his second coming if it was applying to that. But if we apply each day for a year, literal days didn't work, did they? Because it only took us a year and a half later. Let me show you what happens if you apply one day prophetically is equal to a literal year. Now, this is a standard principle like in Bible study, day for year in Bible prophecy. Just curiously, how many people have heard that before, before I come up here anyway? You've heard a day for year in Bible prophecy. Okay, so they didn't really need proof, but some people, just in case, we wanted to prove it anyway. Let me show you what happened. On the screen, the decree goes out in 457 B.C., 483 days later, but we're going to add, make that years later, and it comes to the year 27 A.D. Ooh, now that's a lot closer to the time of Christ, isn't it? Well, was there something that happened in 27 A.D. that we can maybe pinpoint this to and say, hey, there's the fulfillment of the prophecy? Is there? Let us look. The decree goes out in 457 B.C. On your screen there, 457 B.C., you see the decree going out. You add 483 years later, you get to, you get to 27 A.D. Do you know what happened in 27 A.D.? Actually, in the fall of 27 A.D., Jesus was baptized. Now, the decree... Was, went into effect in the fall of 457 B.C. That takes some extra studying to do, but you actually can find out when the decree went into effect. When it went into effect was in the fall of 457 B.C. Now, some people are saying, oh, no, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait, hold it, back up. I got my calculator out, and I put in 457, and, and, and I added 483, and I come up to 26 A.D. You're a year off. True. Let me ask you this. How many people were born in 0 A.D.? Do you have any historical events that happened in 0 A.D.? No? Nothing at all? You want to know why? Because there was no 0 A.D. The, when, you, when you do the timeline, at, at the timeline, you're looking at years in timeline, it goes 5 B.C., 4 B.C., 3 B.C., 2 B.C., 1 B.C., 1 A.D., 2 A.D., 3 A.D., 4 A.D. You understand? There is no 0. So if there's no 0 and you have 483 years, you've got to take out that place marker. And that takes you to 27 A.D., not 26. Is that pretty clear? You understand you have to do that. You have to go, there's no zero in it, so you have to add a year to get to the 27. 27 A.D. Let me show you something from the Bible. See, sometimes we read things in the Bible. I, I'm guilty as anybody else. And I just like the genealogies and stuff like that. Aren't those monotonous? It's like begat, 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 begat. This was the king, that was the king. Sometimes it is, personally, I, I get a little bogged down with that. But other times, I believe it's put there for a very specific reason. Always it's probably a very specific reason, but sometimes it's more, more um, effective than others. Here's one of those. Luke chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Let us go to the book of Luke in the New Testament, chapter 3. And we're going to read verses 1 through 3. I want you to go ahead and go there yourself. We're going to spend some time in the New Testament right now, and I want you to be able to see this. The Bible says, Now in the fifteenth year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar... Pontius Pilate being governor of Judea, and Herod being tetrarch of Galilee. Let me just continue to read from the Bible here. Everybody's still turning out here. Herod being tetrarch of Galilee, his brother Philip tetrarch of Euteria, and of the region of Trachonitis, and Licinius, and the tetrarch of Abilene, and Annas and Caiaphas being the high priest. The word of God came to John, the son of Zacharias, in the wilderness, and he came... And to all the country about Jordan, preaching the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. Now, 
when you read this, it's almost, almost annoying sometimes. You're going through all these names. The word of the Lord came to John the Baptist in this time frame, and this is who was ruling, who was ruling, who was ruling. Did you know there was only one time in earth's history that all these rulers ruled during the same time? It was only a very short time in, in space that they all ruled during the same time. It was the latter part of 27 A.D. As a matter of fact, when, 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 when it says here that in the 15th year of Tiberius Caesar, um, that 15th year of Tiberius Caesar, historically, is guess what year? 27 A.D. Do you think that perhaps when Dr. Luke was writing down the Gospel of Luke there, that the Spirit of God inspired him to take track of all the people that were ruling during that time? It gives you the time frame when Jesus was baptized. Now, what did it say in Daniel chapter 9, verse 25? It talks, or verse 24, and it, it talks about, or 25 rather, Messiah the Prince. You know what the word Messiah means? Anointed one. The anointed one. When was Jesus anointed? Let us continue. Look here on the screen, Luke chapter 3, verse 21 and 22. Luke, 20, Luke 3 now, 21 and 22. We found out the 15th year of Tiberius Caesar was 27 AD. Now on the screen, it says, Now when all the people were baptized, it came to pass that Jesus also being baptized and praying, the heaven was opened and the Holy Ghost descended in a bodily shape like a dove upon him. And a voice came from heaven which said, Thou art my beloved Son, in who I am well pleased. What happened in the year 27 A.D.? Jesus was baptized in the fall of 27 A.D. That's what we have from the Bible. He was baptized. But how do you know that's anointed? Well, let us let the Bible tell us. Look in the book of Acts. You're in Luke. Go to the book of John, then go to the book of Acts. Acts chapter 10, verse 38. It's on the screen here as well, and I'll read it from the screen. How God anointed, what did he do? Anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. So Acts 10, 38 says that Jesus was anointed with what? The Holy Ghost. When was he anointed with the Holy Ghost? When was that? At his baptism. The Holy Ghost descended down in a bodily shape, remember? So what happened in 27 AD that fulfilled the prophecy? Jesus came. You know, it's so interesting, Jesus himself even says so. Now I've shown you, I've given, you the, 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 I've given you the Old Testament text there that says that the Messiah would come at the end of the 69 weeks, right? Now I've shown you from the, from the Bible, from 457 B.C., we moved on along for the 483 years. We moved all the way along to the New Testament. We found out that he came in 27 A.D. and was baptized. Look what Jesus started preaching right after he was baptized. Look what Jesus himself has to say about this. Mark 1, 14 and 15, look what Jesus says. Now, after John was put in prison, Jesus came to Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and saying, what? The time is fulfilled. Now, I got a question to ask. It's pretty simple. What time? What time? Jesus is referring back to the time of Daniel's prophecy. Hey, the time is fulfilled. Now, I want you to imagine, you're living in the, in the days of, of Jesus when he's on the scene, right? He comes along preaching, hey, the time is fulfilled. Do you think the scribes and Pharisees recognized the time was fulfilled? I think they did for sure. I mean, I believe that they studied their Bible quite well. And Jesus came along, they knew what he was talking about when he said the time was fulfilled. But they had to reject him anyway because it did not fit what they wanted the Messiah to be. It did not fit what they had pre predicted, what they, had, what they was, and themselves was applying to the Bible. And they said, we've got to reject him anyway. We've got to kill him. But you know what? The Bible said they would. Back to the book of Daniel. As you're turning back to the book of Daniel, let us review this real quick. On the screen, you see the decree went out in 457 B.C., 483 years later. We have the baptism of Jesus in 27 A.D. Everybody with me? All right, Daniel 9. Back to Daniel chapter 9. Is this, is this clear so far? Pretty clear? You're, you're following me? Okay. The Bible says in Daniel 9, 26. Remember, 9, 25, it, it, it ended up with here, it says, a, a Messiah, the prince, will come in 69 weeks. The streets will be built again. The wall in troublous times. Now look at the next verse. The next verse says, And after three score and two weeks, after the three score and two weeks, shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. What's it say about him? He'll be what? Cut off, but not for himself. Who was he cut off for? Me. Right? Us. So it says, after the three score and two weeks, Messiah will be cut off, but not for himself. Is cut off? What's, what does cut off mean? Well, let us ask the Bible on the screen very quickly. Isaiah 53, verse 8. He was taken from prison and from judgment. And who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living for the transgression of the people he was stricken. So he was cut off out of the land of the living for the transgression of his people. What's it speaking of? 
a messianic prophecy, isn't it? And what's it say about him? He was cut off from what? The land of the living. So in Daniel 9, 26, when it says the Messiah will be cut off, what do you suppose it's referring to? Cut off from the land of the living. Let me give you another text just for kicks and giggles. Keep your place marked there in Daniel chapter 9 and go with me to Genesis chapter 9, 11. Look what it says in Genesis 9, 11. Let me give you another reference on this just to put another nail in the coffin. Genesis 9, 11, the Bible says this. I will establish my covenant with you Neither shall all flesh be cut off any more by the waters of the flood. Neither shall there be any more be a flood to destroy the earth. So what's it referring to there? All flesh shall not be cut off again. What's it talking about? Killed. Cut off. Killed. So in Daniel 9, 26, when it says, After three score and two weeks, Messiah will be cut off. What is it referring to? So sometime after the 69 weeks, the Bible says the Messiah will be cut off. And you know what it tells you exactly when that will be? Now here's where it gets interesting. Stay with me. All right, let me move along here. Isaiah 53, 8 is where that's found. Daniel 9, 27. Well, actually, 9, 26. Let's set 9, 26. I'm sorry. After the three score and two weeks, Messiah will be cut off, but not for himself. The people of the prince shall come and destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end thereof shall be with a flood, and to the end of the war of desolation is determined. Now, let me show you something here. Daniel 9, 25, the first part of that verse, what's that referring to? It's Messiah. You see it? Daniel 9, 25. All right, Daniel 9, 26, the first part of that verse, what's it referring to? Messiah. Daniel 9, 27, the first part of that verse, what's it referring to? Somebody would say the Antichrist. The Bible Hebrew writers are writing in parallelism, and the first part of every verse is talking about the Messiah, the Messiah, the Messiah. The second half of the verse is talking about the city, the city, the city. Okay? So every time in context, it's talking about the Messiah, the Messiah, the Messiah. Wouldn't it be obvious that the last verse also would be talking about the Messiah? Let us look and see. Okay, verse 27 now. And he, he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week, and in the midst of the week he'll cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. So in the middle of the week, the prince, all right, or, or the Messiah actually here, says, and, and he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. In the midst of the week he'll cause the sacrifice and oblation to cease. Okay, does this fit the Messiah? Well, I want you to understand what happens in the middle of the week. Now, some people say, oh, no, this has to apply to the Antichrist. But notice the context. The first half of every verse is the Messiah, the Messiah. And then it's the Antichrist? Listen, listen, brothers and sisters, that doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make any sense at all. Let us read it through real quick one time. I'm going to start in verse 25. Know, therefore, and understand that from the commandment to go forth to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince shall be, here's the time frame. Verse 26, after three score and two weeks shall the Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. Here's where the confusion comes in. Let us just spend a second on it. And the people of the prince shall come and destroy the city and the sanctuary. Do you remember Jesus in Matthew chapter 24 saying, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, he who reads, let him understand. Do you remember reading that in Daniel 9? I mean, I mean Matthew 24, Jesus speaking that, right? What happened in 70 AD to fulfill what Jesus was saying? The temple was destroyed. 70 AD, the temple was destroyed. It was destroyed in 70 AD. This is a prophecy of that very thing. The people of the prince. Who would be that prince? Titus. Titus. The Roman ruler, the, the Roman, uh, uh, the ruler that came in 70 AD to destroy the city. Remember, the second half is about the city. Okay? So here, the first half is about the Messiah. And then after the Messiah is cut off, look, the people of the prince shall come and destroy the city. Do you think Jesus destroyed the city? No, Jesus didn't destroy the city. Who did? Titus and his, and, his, and his army did in 70 AD. They destroyed the city. Jesus says, hey, when you see this taking place, what's spoken of in Daniel, run. You don't, don't take your coat. Get out of the city. Remember what he said? Pray, pray that your flight not be the winter, neither on the Sabbath day. Get out. So the people of the prince, the second half, that's when the, Jerusalem was destroyed in 70 AD. It has to fit. But now you're going down to the next verse, verse 27. It says, he will confirm a covenant with many for one week. Some people say, oh, that's the prince. That, that Prince Titus, the, the one that confirms the covenant there. You don't find any place in the Bible where the Antichrist or anyone can, makes a covenant with anybody. This, you have to twist this to make it happen. But does Jesus make a covenant? Does he make it for a week? Now, go back to where we started. Go back to where we started. Seventy weeks are determined upon your people. Isn't that what it says? They're put on your people. If 70 weeks are determined upon God's people, Daniel's people at this time, the 70 weeks, has it been ended at the end of the 69 weeks? There's still another week to go, isn't there? Another week to go. 
can you take that 70th week away and just put it down somewhere else in the future and say, well, we'll, we'll just apply that some other time. Would that make sense? You have to do that in order to apply this to the Antichrist. But now look how beautifully it fits if we apply it to Jesus Christ. Okay? Look at how it fits if you apply it to Jesus Christ. Let us go on. 457 B.C., the decree goes out. From 457 B.C., how long is it going to the total prophecy? 70 weeks. Isn't that what he said? 70 weeks are upon your people? And he gave, the time, he gave the time beginning of that in 457 B.C. Is everybody with me? So let us follow along. 483 years later, we have the baptism of Jesus. How long did Jesus' ministry last? Three and a half years. You can read the Gospel of John. Figure that out. Now, I want you to notice what it says again in verse 27. Look at verse 27 with me. He shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. And in the middle of the week, he'll cause a sacrifice and oblation to cease. What, what part of the week? Okay. How long is a week? What's half of a week? Three and a half. If a day is a year in Bible prophecy, as we've already shown it is, what's three and a half years after 27 AD take you to? The end of Jesus' ministry when he causes the sacrifice and oblation to cease. Once he's crucified, is there any more reason to bring sacrifices and oblations? Oblation being an offering? Why? Because the Messiah's come. Do you see that? L let me put it up on the screen another way. Look what it says up here. Mark 1, 14 and 15, the time is fulfilled. Jesus is preaching 27 AD, the fall. Three and a half years later, Matthew 27, 15 and 51, the veil of the temple was ripped in two when Jesus was crucified in 31 AD. Do you remember seeing that? Read, reading that in Matthew chapter 27, 15 and 51, the veil of the temple was ripped. Now, how was it ripped? From the top to the bottom, showing that it was the hand of God. If you are me, being a mere man, how would you rip a curtain if you had to rip it? Would you get up on a ladder and climb up on top and start trying to rip from the top? How would you rip it? From the bottom up. But it showed it was the hand of God doing it. Because the prophecy was fulfilled. What did Jesus pronounce when he was on the cross? What did he say? It is what is finished. The sacrifice, the offering, the work that he needed to do to save us in the behalf of man. That work, the main thrust of the work right there, the sacrifice had ended. Look what it says here. Daniel 9, 27, he shall cause the sacrifice and oblation to cease. Did they have any reason to offer sacrifices anymore after 31 A.D.? The spring of 31 A.D., Jesus was crucified on the cross. And look how that fits with Daniel 9, 27. Fits perfectly. A prophecy applying to Jesus Christ, don't apply it to the Antichrist. He came just in time. He died just in time. Back to the screen again. Let me go through it one more time. The decree in 457 B.C., 69-week decree, right? 483 years later, or 69 weeks, you have the baptism of Jesus. You still have one week left in the prophecy because it's a 70-week prophecy. Three and a half years into that prophecy, Jesus dies on the cross. Now listen, listen, try to get this in your head. He causes the sacrifice and oblation to cease when he died on the cross. That's the application. That's how it fits perfectly, hand in glove. The Messiah, the Prince, is the subject of Daniel 9.27. Messiah, the Prince, is the subject, is it not? And he died just in time. Perfect fit. I wish I had time to go into the history of where the whole idea that this applies to the Antichrist comes from for some of you because it comes right out of the Council of Trent. It was to get the finger off the papacy from them being the Antichrist. And they said, we've got to, we've got to do something. We, we've got to reinterpret the books of Daniel. And that's exactly what they did. They reinterpreted the book of Daniel, applied it to some future um, person that's going to come along after the so-called rapture. We proved it was not secret from the Bible altogether. They applied it much into the future. They've taken the, the truth of God's word and twisted it to the point that brothers and sisters, Christians, are taking a prophecy that points to Jesus and they're applying it to the Antichrist. That is very dangerous. Very dangerous. Seventy weeks are determined upon your people and upon the holy city, the Bible says. Upon you, Daniel. There's still some time left in this prophecy. How much time is left? Three and a half years. Now, the full 70 weeks was for who? The Jews. So what happened at the end of the 70 weeks? Oh, brothers and sisters, this is the most powerful of it all, I think. The decree 457. 27 A.D., the baptism. 31 A.D., the cross. And 34 A.D., the gospel goes to the Gentiles. Let me show you from the Bible. Let us go to our Bibles, to the book of Matthew, chapter 5, first. Matthew, chapter 5. Matthew chapter 10, verses 5 and 6. I'm sorry, Matthew chapter 10, verse 5 and 6. Jesus speaking to his disciples. I want you to notice very clearly, very specific words, very specific instructions that Jesus gives his disciples. Go not into the way of the, the Gentiles. So he's sending his disciples out to preach, and he says, don't go the way of the Gentiles. Who's the Gentiles? Us, right? Some people, some people say, I'm a Jew. I trace my bloodline back. Well, fine, but I'm a Gentile. Okay? Go not the way of the Gentiles. And to any city of the Samaritans, don't enter there. 
but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So Jesus, while he's still here preaching, still in the middle of confirming the covenant for the, for the whole week, right? He's got the 70-week prophecy, right? Still in the middle of that prophecy. And who was it for? The Jews. He's still in the middle of that time frame. He says, hey, disciples, go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Why? Because 70 weeks was for the Jews. For them to get things together. Are you understanding this? Clear? Okay, clear as mud. All right. Look at the next one. Matthew 21, 43. Therefore I say unto you, he's speaking, Jesus here is speaking to the, to the, uh, the chief priests, the, the, the Jews themselves, right? He's speaking to them. He says, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation bringing forth the fruits thereof. Now, why would he say something like that? Because Daniel prophesied that the, that the kingdom would be taken from the Jews and given to people bringing forth fruits. The Jews were supposed to go spread the gospel to all the world. Did they succeed? No, they kept it to themselves. They wouldn't share the good news of the Messiah. They wouldn't share the good news of God. They kept it to themselves. And God says, okay, 70 weeks, you've got 70 weeks to get things straight. I know you won't. I'm prophesying here. That doesn't mean he forced it to happen. He just foresaw what was going to happen. He says, now, when you don't get it right, it's going to go to the Gentiles. Is everybody seeing that? Right from the Bible, Jesus himself says, I'm going to take it from you and give it to them. All right, that's what he says. Now, go with me to the book of Acts chapter 7. Acts chapter 7 is, a, is one of the best sermons you'll ever find preached in the Bible. Stephen is preaching his heart out to the, to the leaders of the Jewish nation. The, 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 the high priests, the leaders, they're all being there, and he's recounting the history of Israel, and he's telling them, he's telling them what, he's just giving them what for. He says, like, you bunch of scoundrels, you, you've rejected the Messiah, you've done this, you've done that, and they, they had all they can stand. And you know it was the best sermon, you probably want, maybe the best one preached in the Bible. You know how you know that? Because at the end of the sermon, they killed him. You know it's a good sermon if at the end of it they pick up stones and they kill you. Must be a good sermon, huh? Well, that's what they've done to Stephen here. Now look what happens. We're going to pick it up in verse 54, then, um, in Acts 7, 54. When they heard these things, they were cut to the heart. They gnashed on him with their teeth. But being full of the Holy Ghost, he looked up steadfastly into heaven, and he saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God and said, Behold, I see the heavens open, the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Then they cried with a loud voice and stopped their ears. It's pretty serious when the people you're preaching to stop their ears. They ran upon him with one accord. They cast him out of the city, and they stoned him. Now, for young people, that doesn't mean they gave him drugs. That means they threw rocks at him. They stoned him. And the witness laid down their clothes at a young man's feet whose name was Saul, and the plot is thickening. They stoned Stephen, calling upon God, saying, Je Stephen says, Lord Jesus, do not, uh, please receive my spirit. He knelt down and cried with a loud voice. The Lord lay not this sin to their charge. And then he said, and when he said this, he fell asleep. That means he died. Now, look at verse, chapter 8 and verse 1. And Saul, consenting to his death, at that time there was a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem, and they were scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. Devout men carried Stephen to his burial, and lamentation was made over him. Verse 3, Saul made havoc of the church, entering into every house and helling men and women, committing them to prison. Verse 4, therefore they, they that were scattered abroad went everywhere... Where? Everywhere preaching the word. What happens at this point? The gospel goes to the Gentiles. Do you know that Paul, or Saul here, this guy Saul, in the next chapter he gets a new name. You know what his new name is? Paul. And he becomes the apostle to the Gentiles. What happens in 34 AD? Stephen is stoned, killed. He's killed. And after he's killed, the gospel goes to the Gentiles. They've officially rejected the Messiah. They officially rejected God's word. They officially rejected God. And God says at the end of the 70 weeks, I officially reject you. Daniel 9 says 70 weeks were cut off for who? Israel. And he gives you the starting date, 457 B.C., and like hand in a glove in 34 AD, exactly 490 years later, 70 times 7, 490 years later, they officially reject the gospel, and the gospel goes to the Gentiles. Let us put it on the screen. 457 BC, 483 years later, 27 AD, the baptism. Three and a half years later, he dies on the cross. What happens when he dies on the cross? It is finished, right? The sacrifice and oblation cease. Three and a half years after that, 34 AD, Stephen is stoned, and the gospel begins to go now to the Gentiles. When you read this prophecy in Daniel chapter 9, 
And it fits the Messiah so perfectly, brothers and sisters. To apply it to anything other than Jesus Christ is the work of the Antichrist. I know that's not a popular thing to say in our day and age because much of popular Christianity teaches otherwise. But if you're interested in popular Christianity, this probably isn't the right place for you to be. But if you're interested in the truth of God's word and assurance of what God's word has to say, brothers and sisters, I think you're in the right place. Amen. Jesus came right on time. <laughs> Why in the world? Just, just a little logic for a moment, okay? Think about something. Why would God prophesy about the exact coming of the Antichrist but tell you you have to guess about the exact coming of Jesus Christ? Does that make sense? What do you think God's concerned with? Do you think God's concerned that you know the Antichrist or Jesus Christ? If he's going to spend a whole chapter, the latter part of that chapter, Daniel chapter 9, all that section prophesying about the Messiah to come and we apply it to the Antichrist, that is very dangerous. The Bible says that this prophecy applies to God's people for 70 weeks. At the end of the 490 years, Stephen was stoned and the gospel went. And that's why we're here, still hearing that gospel. My appeal to you is to reread Daniel 9 and consider the truth of God's word there. In the face of all the, of the error that's out there today, brothers and sisters, Jesus came just in time. And I'll tell you this, he's going to come back just in time too. It's his timing. Let us finish with a word of prayer. Father in heaven, I want to thank you so much for your word, for prophecy, that we can have the assurance that what you say will come to pass, will come to pass. Lord, you told us that when you would come, and honestly, Father, it's a shame that the leaders of your church, your people, and they, even in the day you was here, rejected you. Lord, help us not to do the same. I pray that we will not make the same mistake and look at a prophecy that's applying to you and apply it to any other thing than, than the fact that you came just in time. Thank you for doing so, Lord. We're looking forward to you coming back again the second time. May we all be ready, is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.